Okay, so today we are very happy to have Dylan Wilson from Harvard who will tell us something about lichtenbaum quillen phenomena in chromatic homotopy theory. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's nice to, to join this K-theory community. I'm new to it. So, uh, so I'm just getting used to the literature and the history and the uh, just kind of way of being. So uh, if I do something, if I don't say something that I should have said, or if I say something I wasn't supposed to say, or if I just behave in a way that doesn't fit the general vibe, then just interrupt and let, and let me know. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this, all this work is joint with Jeremy Hahn, uh, who's here and will hopefully correct anything I say that misrepresents whatever we're doing. Um, and we owe a huge intellectual debt to Osonian and Rognes, I think. John is here. Hi. Uh, this is all, this was all, uh, you know, they're uh, motivated by their vision. We wouldn't have thought to try to prove this result otherwise. Um, so, okay, so I wanted to, I wasn't sure, uh, uh, I, I kind of want to take a little bit of time to translate a K-theory statement into one that's in homotopy theory, since I'm not sure like the general comfort level with uh, homotopy theory type things. So um, let's just start with the with uh, conjecture of Quillen and, and Lichtenbaum, or I think Quillen stated this in an ICM address. So the can this this first part is is an idea of Waldhausen <clears throat> to translate this statement into a statement in homotopy theory. So uh, the this the original statement is that a tau cohomology might be a sort of approximation to algebraic K theory, at least after modding out by P. So Quillen thought that there should be a spectral sequence like the Atia Hertzberg spectral sequence that at least converges for large. Uh, for large values of the uh, target, large dimensions in the target. I want to say that right off the bat that it's really interesting. Uh, algebraists and homotopy theorists keep trying to imitate one another. And, and then we get this weird feedback loop wherein uh, the, you know, and uh, the algebraists are trying to mimic the Atiyah Hertzberg spectral sequence for complex K theory and invent this thing. And then we try to make all of our spectra act like rings. And so then we do K theory to them and then try to mimic this. It's a, I don't know, it's some strange game where like there's two kids in school and they both think the other one's cool and they both try to dress like them and act like them and they end up converging onto something I hope that's a lot, a lot cooler. So, uh, so what Thomason did is he proved that this target, that there is a spectral sequence that converges, that wants to converge somewhere else, namely to mod PK theory with the bot and element inverted. So he showed again, I'm suppressing all hypotheses everywhere, but um, just to tell the story, but he showed that for suitable R, this thing satisfies a tile descent, I think. Uh, and so that you, you have a, an actually convergent spectral sequence uh, that gets to there. So then the question is transformed in the presence of Thomason descent to this question, which is when is the K theory of R mod P the same thing as the bot inverted K theory of R mod P? When is this the same in large degrees? So as a quick aside, uh, what is this bot inverted K theory? So originally there was this bot element in, in mod P K theory that was constructed in here and then inverted. But uh, K theory mod P is secretly this spectrum tensored with the sphere spectrum mod P. You can mod out P already exists in the sphere. And at least for odd primes, this bot element secretly already exists in the sphere, except not really in the sphere. It exists after modding out by P. There's an element called V1. So really, this is like, even though these seem like very different procedures, 
these are sort of both K theory with coefficients in something. You can think of this as like taking coefficients in something like coefficients mod P or coefficients in this weirder thing where you mod out by P and invert this element. Um, so this hopefully sort of motivates a notion of localization uh, where we can localize P local spectra by killing uh, all things which sort of aren't seen, uh, aren't seen by this. So we kill all finite spectra, which become zero when you, which are acyclic with respect to inverting P or inverting P and, or modding out by P and inverting V1. So for example, this L1F localization of S mod P is S mod P invert V1. That's the, Okay. Sorry, uh, I missed, I guess it was enough. So if you would take completion with respect to P instead of modding by P, you would have an equivalence, right? A uh, where? Don't you? Like, a little In which? like if you invert better. Uh, where? Here, here, where do you want to be? Mm. So what, sorry, sorry again. So what, what was the Thomason thing that you're? Yeah, so the Thomason statement is that for suitable rings are, uh, if you mod out by P, you get the same answer as modding out by P and inverting beta in large degrees, I think. So, sorry, that's not Thomason's statement. That's if you knew Thomason descent, then this statement would be equivalent to Lichtenbaum equivalent. Does that? Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so I'm just going to rewrite this is just the same, it turns out, as, as, uh, as modding out by P and doing this L1F localization. So it's like if you're in equivalence after modding out by P uh, and doing this L1F localization, that's kind of like saying you're p attic equivalence uh, for this L1F localization. Um, you're always kind of a rational equivalence. So you can, it turns out that whatever, if you do some messing around, a, a reformulation of this question is that for suitable rings R, um, this map, this localization map is an isomorphism in large degrees. So again, in if you knew this sort of descent result, then you could restate uh, lichtenbaum quillen in this way for suitable rings R. And now I've said this word suitable rings like a lot of times. One thing I wanna say, um, and again, I'm just like, plagiarizing Waldhausen here. This was exactly the way that Waldhausen made this connection. Um, one thing that's nice about this statement is, so in the original statement involving a tau cohomology, like P had to be inverted in R for that to be a good idea, right? Um, but this statement makes sense whether or not P is, is inverted in R. Um, and, uh, and it's a useful idea because if you wanted to ask the question for something like, you know, the p local integers where you invert p, in other words, the rational numbers, then it's the same as asking it for the p local in integers. And then this is an entirely p local question about p local things. Um, so this is a question you can ask for any ring, and then you could hope that there's a suitable class of rings for which it's true. Is this okay? So um, a closely related thing you can say, so if you, if you take this L1F and you mod out by P and V1, right? Like here, I was sort of supposed to invert V1. So if I instead modded out by V1, I would get zero. So saying that this is an equivalence in large degrees would imply that the fiber, the fiber is, uh, is bounded above after modding out by by P and V1. So it, a closely related uh, statement is whether or not this object is bounded above. Uh, and under a slightly more hypothesis, like if you instead ask that this is bound, that this is bounded above and only has finite homotopy groups in each degree, then this, this also implies this statement. So this is kind of the version that we're gonna focus on.
And again, I'm pushing some stuff under the rug. When P is two, you should, you, there is no V1, um, but there's a V1 to the fourth, so you can ask the same question there. Okay, is this okay? Because I'm gonna like run with this in a second. So <laughs> I wanna make sure that, with, that I don't just start doing homotopy theory and people are like, what happened to my K theory? Uh, <laughs> can you say again, what do you mean when you write in the presence of tumbles and descent? Yeah, so I just mean that like, I, I wanna, like it would make me feel better to call this Lichtenbaum Quillen because then I could say that we proved an analog of Lichtenbaum Quillen, but it's a bit of like a lie if, because the original Lichtenbaum Quillen statement is secretly a statement like this combined with the statement that like the LNF or L1F K localized K theory satisfies some type of descent. And we didn't prove that. Some other people oh, in this I room see. proved There's things Lichtenbaum like that. Quillen minus Thomas. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> right, yeah, 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 this, yes, great. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, you're asking for crumples. So, so I mean, I guess the, the idea is that Thomason did prove something like this as well as the, the tall version, right? Good to know. I didn't know that. Good. <laughs> okay. But I, well, I see he proved something like that, I guess then I'm wondering what was left because I thought there was some other, I thought at the end of the day, you know, it's sort oh, of- Oh, no, 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 I think I see you're right. Okay, excuse yeah, me, right. I'm, I'm getting my stuff. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So, so now I wanna like make a statement that's more general. Uh, so I need to give a quick review of chromatic homotopy theory that'll just kind of be tailored to this purpose. To this purpose. So one way to think of, um, what I'm about to do is asking for more general coefficients like we just talked about. So you can take homology with integer coefficients and that's like taking your space or spectrum and tensoring it with the integers and then taking its homotopy groups. You could also take Z mod P homology and that's like tensoring with Z mod P or you could think of it um, as tensoring with Z and then doing something over the sphere, if you like, because P exists in the sphere. And similarly here, instead of doing P inverted uh, homology, you could invert P in the sphere. So, it, and, and this is kind of like, you know, if we only care about the P local homotopy a homology or something, then these are the two procedures we have to, these are the two sorts of coefficients we are happy to compute with. You could try the more general coefficients that we mentioned earlier, where you take uh, S mod P and then invert V1, and you'd find that you get zero. So, so these are kind of it if you care about ordinary homology. If you care about other homology, then your question is what sorts of things like S mod P can I smash with? And one answer is uh, this theorem of Devonats, Hopkins, and Smith, which tells you all of the different ideals in the category of finite spectra. So there's, you could tensor with S and that's not very exciting. I mean, it's very exciting. It's too exciting. So we need to do something else. <laughs> so we could instead tensor with, with uh, S mod P. And this would give us some information about the mod P homotopy groups or mod P uh, you know, homology with mod P coefficients if we want to tensor with some other homology theory first. And then once you've modded out by P, it turns out that there's, there exists something called a V1 self map uh, of this complex and you can mod out by that as well. So these little brackets mean the thick sub subcategory or equivalently the tensor, the thick tensor ideal generated by this object. So Devonats, Hopkins and Smith show that, um, that these are all of the, of the tensor ideals in P local finite spectra. So these are like all of the choices of uh, sort of mod whatever coefficients that we can choose. And then if we wanna zoom in at a specific level, uh, then we would invert the corresponding map uh, instead of modding out by it. So, so if I wanted to know about 
heights. This is called either type or height. If you wanted to know about heights bigger than or equal to n, then that's seen by kind of a complex that looks like this. And if you wanted to know about height equal to n, then you would invert that last map. So this is kind of a cartoon of chromatic homotopy theory, but other, uh, I could say more and I'm brushing lots under the rug, but are there questions about this picture? It's just gonna be there to kind of motivate. Okay. Um, okay, so now we can define this, this generalization of L1F instead of uh, um, annihilating things like S mod P or S mod P V1. Um, this will just be the localization which um, annihilates everything in this thick subcategory. So it's killing things of height um, of height bigger than n. Okay. So then, uh, so Mahold and Rask introduced another version of height. So this this type of version of height is good if I want to talk about finite complexes, but that's sort of like my coefficients. I I want to have ask another question like about the integers. The integers aren't finite complex. I want to ask like what coefficients should I be looking at for a given homology theory? It's a sort of different question. Um, and you know we saw that like um, uh, right. So so we saw that like for z is only interesting or z localized to p, it's only interesting to take coefficients in sort of S mod P and S mod P with V1 inverted, right? Um, and when we were looking at K theory of a ring, we wanted coefficients, yeah. Sorry. Uh for ZP, you mean S mod P and S with P inverted, right? Oh, ah, yeah, yeah, sorry, thank you, good call. Yes. Yes, and then uh, for K theory of a ring, we wanted coefficients uh, like um, S mod um, P with V1 inverted, and we also saw that it came up that we were interested in S mod P and V1. And of course, we could take coefficients in S mod P just and S. And similarly here, we could have taken coefficients in S, but I was sort of giving the end of what seems to be useful. Uh, so let me make a definition. This is due to Mahold and Resk. Um, so if E, some spectrum that we're thinking of as like a cohomology theory or homology theory, we want to take coefficients in, uh, we're going to think about things that are P complete and bounded below. Then it has FP type N if uh, this sort of slightly strange condition is satisfied. So I can look at all finite spectra such that at, when I take coefficients in that finite spectrum, then I have only finitely many homotopy groups and they're all finite. So in other words, I look like a, a direct sum of, of copies of um, like FP. Okay. So I, I want to look at that. That's a thick subcategory. So it's one of these ideals. Uh, and I'm going to say I have FP type N if I'm this ideal. If it's this ideal. So this is sort of capturing basically what are the coefficients. So, so basically, this means that after these coefficients, like if I tried to now invert VN plus one, I would get something that's zero. So all the later types of coefficients are going to be uninteresting. That makes sense. Okay. So let's give some examples. So FP has FP type zero. So does like Z mod P squared and so on, because if I tensor it with S, the sphere spectrum, it's already finite. ZP is FP type one, because if I tensor it with S mod P, then I'm finite, but not before. If I tensor any of these versions of K-theory, connective complex K-theory, so this is uh, connective complex K-theory, connective real K-theory, the atom sum and 
in here, which is the fixed points for uh, the CP action or CP minus one action. Then uh, these are all of FP type two, because if I kill P and then I still have this bot element left over, which is like a V1 and I kill that, then I suddenly only have finitely many homotopy groups left over. Okay. If you've heard of TMF, then it's FP type three. If you haven't heard of it, it's still FP type three, but maybe it doesn't matter as much. Um, and then there's sort of these prototypical examples, uh, which are these truncated Brown-Peterson spectra uh, after P completion, which are FP type N. So they I have think your first four examples are off by one, but I think the BPN is correct. My first four examples are off by one. I agree. There's always this problem. <laughs> the definition of type and FP type are, are off by one with respect to each other. So it's always very confusing. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, sorry. Yeah. So what's the relation between FP type and height? Yeah, so it's this relation. I guess like it depends. I could answer the question with the other question, which is what's the definition of height? So somehow <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So I think that's the issue is that there's like various notions of what height is. At the end of the day, there's the notion of a height of a formal group law or something. And there's various ways to import that as a sequence of numbers in some filtration of something in homotopy theory. And this is one of them. So in some sense, you could say FP type is the height or something or plus or minus one. Uh, and, um, but another notion of height might be the height of or type of a finite complex. And then the relationship is, uh, is this definition, which is that you look at, um, you look at this collection of finite complexes that after tensoring with E makes it finite uh, in homotopy. And then that's going to be correspond to some uh, collection of type n plus one spectra. Leon, sorry, uh, can I ask a question? So is so you could ask the same thing uh, and the same definition as this, but instead of asking that the homotopy groups are zero, you could ask the V tensor E is zero. Sorry, instead of homotopy okay. are finite, you could ask, are these two notions related or? Um, I mean, clearly, if the tensor is zero, then the homotopy groups are finite. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, for some reason, I'm having trouble imagining p complete bounded below things that would oh. that, that would that would make this be zero. Oh, because they're bounded below. I see. Oh. Somehow, like this, I don't even know if this is really the right notion. I mean, I don't like, like this wants to be, it's sort of like you started, if you think about why did we introduce something like this where you're sort of finite, really we cared more that it was bounded above. Like we wanted to do homotopy theory in a world where the map from the K theory of R to the LN plus one F localization or whatever looked like an equivalence. So it's almost like we really wanted to do homotopy theory where we killed everything that's like bounded above after tensoring with a finite complex. Uh, but I, I don't really know, no, no one seems to talk about that, but maybe that's something you could define and study. And it would be, it, that would be like the most natural place that LNF, that Verdier quotient would be like where LNF wants to be defined on, I think. And I think, I don't know, maybe it would be worth revisiting some of what Mahal Dresk did without this kind of extra finiteness condi condition. But I don't know. Now, all those are good questions about, yeah, what thinking of variance of this. Okay, so I think I left off with this BPN. So this is this is a family of examples at a prime, which uh, goes through every FP type, <clears throat> and um, these are its coefficients. That doesn't tell you a whole lot. But, but if you uh, imagine that I named these generators uh, not to confuse you, then you can also do the calculation yourself that if you mod out by P through VN, then you're left with FP, which certainly is finite. 
Okay, and, and these generalize some of the preceding examples. BP minus one is FP, BP zero is ZP, uh, BP one is this atom sum and BP two is a, a version of TMF with level structure at, at some primes. So, so these are some examples. Are we good with FP type? Okay. So some examples related to K theory. So Quillen computed the K theory of FP and it's like CP. So this thing is FP type one. Oh, am I off by one again? Yes, this is FP type zero. This is FP type, I think I'm off by one everywhere. Let's try it again. Uh, so KZP, Bakshit, Madsen, and Ragnar set the prime two computed that this thing is of FP type, okay, zero to one, right? Okay. <laughs> um, and then Osoni and Ragnar set primes bigger than or equal to five. Um, did the K theory of connective complex K theory and this atom sum and, and got it to be FP type. Well, let's complete the pattern, zero, one, two. Good. Okay. All right. So in the tradition of chromatic homotopy theory, really the tradition of chromatic homotopy theory is like at here we would have made the conjecture, <laughs> but, but, but in the tradition of chromatic homotopy theory, if something is true for heights zero, one, and two, you must conjecture it's true for all heights. So, so this is a version of the redshift conjecture of Osoni and Ragnus. There's lots of different statements you could make that is related to Maria's statement of what do you mean by height? So, so here's a very loose version, um, which is that for suitable, uh, whoops, for suitable E1 rings, uh, which you can do K theory to, which have FP type N, uh, then their P complete K theory has FP type N plus one. I don't know. Is this, John's in the room. Do you, is this a allowed version of your conjecture? You sign off on this? Oh, you're muted, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, there is a talk in Obovolfa from 2000, which is quite similar to this, at least. Um, I mean, where there's a statement, I, I guess it's just posed as a problem or a question at the time, but. Um, yes, I will. But, but then, yeah, then there was a, um, there you go. Well, I, I'm not going to spend your time. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, so there's this notion, I think, of pure FP type, which is another possibility. There's another thing of, uh, like, this sort of simpler variance where you could just ask about the KN plus one localization being zero or not zero. There's lots of different things you could mean here. Dylan, could I ask? So, I mean, this is also, not only kind of a chromatic statement, but also some kind of finiteness statement. Uh -huh. Because most bounded below P complete spectra will not have bounded FP type, finite FP type. Yes. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So so this is, and that's again related to that thing I was talking about earlier. Like this formalism existed because Mahold and Rask were interested in sort of talking about height in a certain way, but it's, it's not clear to me whether it's like the only thing you could do or should do or think about. And it's unclear if the finiteness, um, yeah, I just don't know. I don't know uh, enough about uh, sort of if we should expect this to hold more generally for some notion of height that like doesn't require that finiteness and so on. Thanks. So uh, this is really, so this, I want to say that this is like a version of Lichtenbaum Quillen, but that that's only with the caveat from earlier. So there's lots of um, work of Klaus and uh, Naumann and Noel that sort of establish the types of descent results uh, that make this a little bit more easy for me to call uh, a version of, of Lichtenbaum. Oh yeah, wow. Yeah. It's like, you know what happened is uh, I, I was on Akil's page looking at all of his, uh, oh, Matthew, Akil gets a different color. So, <laughs> but um, I, uh, I was on Akil's page, like trying to quickly do a literature review 
And so when you're on someone's page, they usually don't say their own name <laughs> when they're listing the authors to a paper. So I was copying too quickly. Um, uh, so sorry about that. Um, and then I should also mention a related thing, which we won't talk about here uh, with, um, with uh, uh, Land, Meyer, and Tom, uh, gives a kind of uh, evidence for red sh that red that the shift isn't more than shouldn't be more than one in many examples <laughs> that uh, you're not going to shift more than one. Okay, so this is the version of the conjecture. There's other things. If you prove that something else that's better about BPN, then we'll change. We'll will retract calling our thing redshift and you get to call your thing redshift. That's the, that's the rules. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, so this is the thing that we were able to prove is that uh, I should say FP uh, is that the K theory of BPN P completed has FP type N plus one. And there's a slight caveat, which is that I was lying that there is a the BPN. There are many BPNs. So we do this for a particular form of BPN uh, that has an E3 ring structure. Okay. And as a corollary, like we said earlier, this if this statement seems more lichtenbaum quillany to you, uh, we're able to show that this map is, is an isomorphism in large degrees. Okay, are there any questions about the statements of the theorem? I have a I have a quick question. So, mm -hmm. so in the schemes world, you are allowed to like let, you know, the input be like a finite type x scheme or something like this. This is true for like BPN algebras as opposed to just BPN things like this. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we haven't checked. So there's there's a state. I think the answer is true for like the most most uh, for the first types of things you'd put in, stick in there, like BPN adjoin a variable or something like that, I think. Um, so Akil pointed out that, so I'm gonna go through the a sketch of the proof in a second and there's sort of two steps to it. And Akil pointed out that um, uh, one of the, that if you're a BPN algebra, then um, then you you can skip one of the steps because you can use this fact. So, that probably didn't make any sense. I'm gonna say that, say it again once I give you the overview, and then I'll say a thing that Akil pointed out. So I think I think you can you you can use this result to deduce it, um, sort of redshift type statements or statements like this for other, and certainly statements like LKN plus one is non-zero for lots of other rings, just by like mapping to this one and doing various tricks. But I think it's like a really important question to sort start to sort out like what generality, like what can you actually deduce from this and what generality should we expect this thing to be true in? And it's a little awkward that BPN is not an E infinity ring. So it's like, you can't, it, it's harder to think about setting up a theory that's very analogous to the kind of arithmetic and classical theory. Um, anyway, I don't know, I don't know. I would love to know. Any other questions or comments or? Okay. Yeah, there's a beautiful story uh, that like John work was talked about in, in the, you can find it in the archive if you search chromatic redshift <laughs> uh, in a talk that he gave uh, about like, what sort of thinking about what should be an analog of this like, doing a tau cohomology, but at higher chromatic heights. I think that would be super interesting to work out. Like, how do you get the full lichtenbaum quillen story, not just uh, this statement? Okay, so here's a sketch of the proof. So the first step, like I alluded to earlier, is that we have to make sure that BPN uh, has enough structure. So it already had an E1 structure, um, but we wanted it to have more um, to do some things. And uh, so the first step was to build an E3 MU algebra structure on BPN. Uh, MU is some 
thing that BPN is a module over. And uh, so we wanted this structure. Uh, so MU is a nice, so MU is this nice uh, ring spectrum, E infinity ring spectrum, whose homotopy groups are a polynomial algebra and infinitely many variables. And, uh, and, and we wanted to do things, uh, yeah, so we needed to compute things like THH of BPN, and that's quite hard, uh, but it turns out to be a lot easier to compute things like THH of BPN relative to MU. So this is like a variation on a trick that I think was realized pretty recently um, by people like, uh, uh, I don't know who was first to do it, Schulze or, I don't know, you know better than me, but uh, wh whoever was first to uh, think about uh, taking THH relative to things like S adjoin Z in order to get cleaner answers. Uh, I would wanna... DNS, like Batmore Schulze. Batmore Schulze, okay. Thank you, sorry, I apologize. Maybe I shouldn't have guessed, I should have just had someone say. Batmore and Schulze. Um, so where you kind of have the generator Z come in and hit a uniformizer, and then you get this cleaner answer for THH. So BPN has these variables like P, V1, V2, Vn. So you might think, okay, well, let's do it relative to like S adjoin that. Unfortunately, that thing, which is gone now, is uh, not an E infinity ring. So uh, you can't like, define a circle action, as far as I know, on relative THH, if you don't have any infinity ring. Uh, so that kind of messes things up. Uh, but MU is sitting around, it's perfectly good. It's got like too many generators, but that's fine, we can live with that. So it turns out if you do this THH relative to MU, the answer is a polynomial algebra over BPN star on even degree classes, which is in stark contrast to THH of BPN itself, which is kind of not as nice. <laughs> so um, I, I like to think of this as like an analog of the Bachstead periodicity theorem. It kind of uses the same computational input. So this is like the thing you do to start studying TC and THH and everything of, um, of BPN. So uh, if it wasn't clear already, the, our tactic, our technique for proving this result on K-theory is to do what everyone does uh, and, and go to a TC statement. So recall that TC uh, after Nicolas and Schulze is, um, can be defined or computed in this way where you take THH and you take its fixed points for the circle action and it's Tate fixed points for the circle action and you form this equalizer. So you have two maps, you have a canonical map that you always have from the homotopy fixed points to the Tate fixed points. And then there's this Frobenius map on THH of a ring, a ring spectrum called phi and you can take its homotopy fixed points. So you're supposed to take the equalizer of these two maps. So if you wanna know TC of something, you're supposed to know, you better compute something about this, something about this and something about each of the maps. And what we want to show, like when you translate across the trace map, what the thing we need to show is, is we need to show that this thing is bounded above. That's what we have to show. We also need to show it has its finite, its finite dimensional in each degree, but that's somehow not as relevant for what I'm going to say. It's also true though, but yeah. Okay. So we need to study each of these maps. And so here's the information we need about each of the maps. So the first thing that we can do is study this Frobenius. And uh, we prove a version of the Siegel conjecture. So the Siegel conjecture uh, for THH has been studied by lots and lots of people uh, for rings. Um, I think, I'm trying to remember, I mean, for the sphere spectrum, it's due to, it's the Siegel conjecture for the sphere spectrum and the group CP. Um, for, for like FP algebras, I think it was proven by Hesselholt that like THH of a say regular uh, FP algebra, I think um, that the Frobenius mod 
uh, is, an, is an equivalence in large degrees. Um, I think uh, Luno Nielsen and, and Ragnus proved THH of MU. I think that uh, um, I should have prepared this ahead of time. Sorry, sorry. I think that uh, um, JD. Uh, key ring spectra called the YNs. Um, am I missing any? Do you know a Siegel conjecture? I don't know. Okay. Okay. So, um, right. So we have to prove a statement like this. So this is a sort of thing that's been uh, sort of, I don't know, it's expected to hold for some class of, of rings or ring spectra. I don't know if people have figured out which ones they expect it for, but uh, this seems to be the sort of thing that people are okay to look for. The next step, so what we did is we showed that this Frobenius map is basically an equivalence, um, and we want this equalizer to be mostly zero. So that's like, seems good, except that we have this canonical map in the way, so that's rough. If the canonical map were like also mostly an equivalence, that would be bad. So, so we need the difference of these two things to be mostly an equivalence. So one way out would be if this canonical map was like mostly zero. So that's what we prove. So, so we prove that um, this canonical map, so we call this canonical vanishing, not to say that it vanishes canonically, but that the canonical map vanishes. Sorry, just is what it is. So uh, the, this canonical map vanishes mod these generators P through v plus, Vn plus one in high degrees. So those are the three main steps uh, in the proof. I'll, I'm going to go over some ingredients for them in a second, but are, are there any questions for, does that seem like a good outline? Do you feel, do you believe that if we <laughs> prove, if we completed those steps, we would be happy? Okay. I guess I could mention that, I mean, for the step two for the Siegel conjecture, then of course, in the case of local, it brings of integers in number in local number fields. So for the integers and things like that, that one also confirmed. I mean, so the, the work by Buxtet, Madsen, myself, and then Hesselwald and Madsen on, on the Lichtman Kuhn conjecture for local fields is a case of, starts with a case of this for when, when the ring is, say the ring of integers in a local periodic field. Yes, thank so that's you. One more, thank one more example. No, thank you. Yeah, that's a great example. And I think another one is, now that you mention it, is B, don't you do this with, with Osoni for, for BP1 as well, a version of this? Yeah. Great. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. And then it's only those KU. Great, yeah. Good. Okay, great. Uh, Actually, sorry, could I just ask a question about the SQL conjecture? Uh -huh. Is there a relationship between the SQL conjectures for VPN, uh, which, so as I understand, this is in large enough degrees, and the SQL conjecture for MU, that, um, which, as I understand, is I mean, it's, it's, it's just true. true. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, that's a good question. So it's like, I don't actually think you can deduce the Siegel conjecture for, say, BP or MU um, by, by sort of taking the limit of these. But if you just do our argument, if you just do our argument when n equals infinity, then, and then don't do any of this, uh, <laughs> then it just also works. It's a little like weird. It's like when n equals infinity, suddenly you just don't have to do this part. <laughs> but uh, but if you just do, yeah, if you just do our argument word for word, the, the point of like somehow calculationally what's going on is like uh, there's like really you have in here and in here some kind of like maybe with FP coefficients, some kind of like little exterior algebra, um, which is like very finite looking. And so that seems good. And then you've got some polynomial algebra which is on is scaring you, and so then you get rid of it. So like the, these these this modding out by stuff's job is to get rid of these sort of big polynomial algebras. But somehow magically, like those polynomial algebras are like ghosts that disappear at infinity. So when you compute thh of mu, 
you actually just know what THH of MU is, like, because you know what the MU homology of like SU is. So, so that's just already an exterior algebra and the, comp the sort of argument we give just works without modding out by anything. I don't know if any so, of that made sense. So does that also explain why it's true without, I mean, it, it's true not only in high enough degrees, but it's true entirely. Yes, uh, because I don't need to, yeah. So the, a lot of the stuff that comes into this high enough degrees is like, there's two things that contribute to this high enough degrees. One is, is that I'm lying to you when I write P through VN. I secretly, right, I, I might have to take powers of the VIs at various steps. So that's can be annoying. Um, and then the other thing is that left over inside each of these is not in the infinite case, is like some polynomial algebra or, or Laurent series on something, which has a dimension. And, and, and it's that thing that's, or, or sorry, let me take it back. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's what's going on. So I think that 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 number is is some is like v n plus one, the degree of v n plus one, or whichever one exists, is contributing to this fact. If I'm remembering correctly. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So this, thing, uh, yeah. So now I can also answer the question that uh, that Eldon was asking earlier, which is like you know, what other, or, or at least talk about it for a second. So, you know, what other things other than BPN can you get? And I just want to point out that um, if you want to prove something, so you can try to do the same argument for like any R and then fail, but you can try. And uh, so you, you hope that you can establish something like the Siegel conjecture and something like this canonical vanishing. And what Akil pointed out is that if R is a BPN algebra, then, um, then you can use you don't have to establish canonical vanishing. You can use the fact that it holds for uh, for BPN to kind of get what you need um, just from the Siegel conjecture. So if you have a BPN algebra and you can verify the Siegel conjecture, then you're happy. Okay. So here are the key ingredients. So as I mentioned before, the key ingredient both this turns that this calculation comes up both in constructing the E3 ring structure via some type of obstruction theory uh, on BPN and also in these sort of calculations that we need to make. Uh, key is understanding and computing this THH of BPN relative to MU. Uh, and then the other, which the ingredients for this have sort of, uh, I think kind of existed for a while, but we couldn't find this particular comp computation in literature. Uh, I guess to make, you need to know in sort of that BPN is an E3 ring to make this computation. <laughs> so maybe that's what was in the way because we do kind of an inductive argument. Um, uh, but once you know that you can use the same old power operation that everyone always uses, uh, like Steinberger's relation, which I think was also proven by Bachstedt. Uh, at, at least mod decomposables to get um, to get the sort of relation you need to turn this thing into a polynomial algebra instead of a divided power algebra. Does that sound familiar? So it's just like Bachstedt, uh, Bachstedt's theorem. Um, the next step is uh, some ingredients for so uh, for the canonical vanishing. So for the canonical vanishing result, we're interested in studying this canonical map from homotopy fixed points to the Tate fixed points. Um, and you, can, you don't always have a Frobenius when you do THH relative to an arbitrary base, but you always have a, a circle action and you always have this canonical act map. So as long as the base is E infinity. So you're able to study, um, so study this canonical map from THH of BPN HS1. Sorry, I'm squeezed in here. Um, by descent from THH of BPN relative to MU HS1 or Tate S1. So once you know this is a polynomial, algebra, 
on even degree generators, uh, then these are easy to compute because the spectral sequences collapse immediately. And importantly, inside here, you can name, uh, you can find an element Vn plus one and name it. Um, so you can start detecting that it's not zero, that it's not, uh, it's not no potent, so you can invert it, uh, all sorts of things like that. So that's how we get the canonical vanishing argument. And then for the Siegel conjecture, the idea is that, um, is that BPN has a filtration, um, which is essentially a sped up version of the Adams filtration with associated graded given by FP a join. It's given by an, an FP algebra. And if you, you can take THH of filtered rings and that thing will have a Frobenius that changes the messes with the filtration uh, and you can study it and so on. But uh, as I mentioned before, um, so Hesselholt proved uh, the Siegel conjecture for, for nice enough FP algebras. And this is basically one of those, except that these are in positive degree. So you have to deal with that separately. But, but it turns out to be not so bad to establish using known results, the Siegel conjecture for this. Um, and then that ends up implying the Siegel conjecture for, uh, for, for BPN itself. So what are the filtrations now uh, in the associated graded here? So it depends on, on, uh, on how you name. So, so I would define the filtration. I would like define uh, the filtration to be slightly different than how I would define the filtration of the spectrum. Uh, so I would just name these to be in their, their usual atoms filtration, but they actually end up showing up in Oh, it's like a shearing the issue. So the point is that like, if you just do the Adams tower, then the associated grader would give you the E1 page. But if you do the decalage of the Adams tower, then it gives you the E2 page. Um, and then there's a, you know, a, something that I would mess up if I tried to do it now. That's the, you know, some analytic geometry telling you the formula for how to take a pair of indices corresponding to the first filtration and get the second. So I. I would, I would definitely mess it up if I tried, but it's in the paper. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Okay. Okay, so, um, ah, right, uh, Jeremy, that's a good point, Jeremy. For, yeah, for BPN, uh, I don't know, that might give you the dif different filtration degrees. Jeremy, I don't know. In any case, yes, there's another way to define a filtration without doing that decalage thing, which is to do what Jeremy just said, which is to mix the Posnikov tower with the Pianic thing. Okay. Um, okay, so this sort of thing brings up some questions uh, that I don't know the answer to. So one I mentioned along the way, which is, kind of how generally should we expect one of these kind of, like is this canonical vanishing phenomena that we've observed? Uh, I mean, other people have observed it, but um, is it sort of how generally do we expect something like that to be true? Um, is it supposed to be true for the same class of things that we expect the Siegel conjecture to be true for, for some version of it? Another question that came up earlier is really sorting out like what what we what is the domain uh, that we expect um, suitable R to kind of encompass um, for the redshift conjecture for um, the Siegel conjecture type statements for canonical vanishing. What what sorts of conditions are we supposed to be putting on these? Another question which. Akil asked, and which we're, we've been talking about with him, is to think about um, you know this descent from MU gives you some canonical filtration on TC minus at least or TP of um, your favorite MU algebras, of which there are many. Uh, so this defines some type of filtration, and there are other famous known filtrations on TC minus and TP 
um, of sort of ordinary rings. And the question is, uh, first of all, is there, what is the relationship between those when they both are defined? And is this like a useful thing or does it have a nice description um, more generally? So that's something we've been thinking about. Uh, another question is about just, you know, we introduce these sort of, or we introduce slash modify existing spectral sequences in the course of our argument. And uh, we like just do enough with them to prove the thing we want, um, but they're there, they're sitting there, um, these spectral sequences, and they're a little different than the ones in the literature, these sort of two different ways in to study uh, THH, either through this kind of Adams Towery approach or this descent from MU. And it would just be interesting to, to see if they're computationally useful, like if you can actually um, get some more mileage out of those. Um, like, I think there was one question uh, about, uh, you know, you know the answer for what THH of MU Tate fixed points are by the Siegel conjecture that Luno, Nielsen, and, and Ragnus proved. Um, but you don't really know like why the differentials in the Tate spectral sequence like uh, conspire to, to make that the answer as far as I know. Um, and uh, it would be interesting to see, there are some different differentials you can kind of read off from our spectral sequence, and it would be interesting to know if you could kind of compare or deduce differentials one way or the other. And then the last question I have is more speculative, which is, um, so there's this cool result of, uh, is this Bot, uh, Bot, Klaus, and Matthew, I want to say? I want to write it and then someone will tell me if this is the result of Bot, Klaus, and Matthew or not. So it says that the K1, the K1 localization of, um, for, of if R is a commuted ring, then the K1 local K theory I'm missing of uh, R adjoined zeta P to infinity is the same as P completed K theory homology of K of R. Is that? Am I missing anyone? I mean, I think there, maybe there was also preceding work of Mitchell that was in this, in this direction. Always okay. happy. Oh, okay. So, um, so I mean, more generally, so I, I point to this because I don't know, it seems more tempting to want to generalize this. So uh, some, a delta ring structure is present on the homotopy groups of any uh, K1 local E infinity ring. And, uh, and I guess my, my question is like, is there some higher chromatic, I'm sure other people are already thinking about this. I don't think, I was just thinking of questions to ask. Is there some higher chromatic analog of a formula like this for some nice input here? Because we do know that the E, the Morava E theory of things uh, has, a, has power operations, which are like some higher version of a delta ring. So if you had a formula like this, then it would be telling you that some nice class of K, of K theory of things uh, wants to have sort of a higher chromatic analog of a delta ring structure. I'll stop with that speculative attempt to like join the club of K theory folks and, uh, and end there. Okay, let's uh, give Don a round of applause. No questions, really? Oh, I have a, I have a question. Um, so Dylan, uh, when you guys construct this version of BPN, you make a choice of generator homotopy of MU with this certain condition. And um, I'm curious how you know that this is possible given a couple of things. One, that the complex orientation of connective K theory is given by the Todd genus, which rationally takes Hold on one all... second. I'm, yeah. I'm going to be really rude because of arrangements in the, in the, I, I have to move to the basement, but I'm going to keep listening to you okay. and have my video off while you're 
speaking. Sorry about that. No, no problem. So, so the Todd genus tells you what these generators have to do. They have to go to some power of the bot element, but this is you're getting different MU algebra structures, at least on BP1, than what's standard? That is totally possible. Uh, so the way that it works is we prove that there is some E3 ring structure, and we definitely don't promise we're producing your favorite one. Um, and then our theorem about K theory works for any choice of E3 ring structure. So it's like that all the computations don't care what E3 ring structure you're using. Um, but let's see if this, okay, this will be my embarrassing base dark basement, but um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, so all of the computations don't care what E3 ring structure you're using. So you could very well use KU with the, um, with its e standard e, e infinity structure. Um, but we just needed our theorem to be not vacuous. So we need to make sure there were some E3, E3 ring structures around. Does that answer your question or? The, the fact that key theory is insensitive to the choice at the end does. It, it seems in general, whenever I ask someone to write down a complex orientation of anything on coefficients, um, it, it's essentially impossible. Um, yeah. So. But so we don't end up needing to know much about, uh, like at the end of the day, the theorem is about the K-theory of the ring, which doesn't care about its complex orientation. Yes, yeah, so, no, I was just surprised at how easy the THH computation was. Yeah, yeah. Because if you just assume the map to be pretty nice, which is what it seems like you're doing, and of course you proved that it works, I'm not trying to be a jerk, um, but then... <laughs> the THH computation comes out of like how nice that orientation is. Well, so what's, so the THH computation, like at two steps, you're doing a, a kind of a bar. And each time you do a bar, you're ignoring decomposables. And, uh, you know, complex orientations, like asking me where the eyes go mod decomposables is suddenly like a lot uh, less dependent on the choice of complex structure than it was before. Does that make help? That helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? A good comment that in the computations with Arsoni for the BP1 case, we also didn't actually know precisely which uh, E3 structure or E2 structure on BP1 we were on BP1 we were using. So there were questions about you know how unique is it. But but the computations just with with those V of one coefficients, the computations just don't see the difference. So, so there's some potential. I, I could ask if there. I mean, so so we made computations if we assume that there existed a Smith Todd complex V of n. So if the prime and n were such so nice that V of n existed as a probably homotopy commutative ring spectrum, then we were able. Then we could sort of do, you can do more or less what we did with the V1 homotopy of TC BP1 to try to compute the VN homotopy of TC of BPN. And you actually get a formula. You, you find that it's it's a free module, essentially a free module on, on a VN plus one generator on a, an explicit finite list of generators in specific degrees. And, and in a way, if you compare this with the RT Hirsebrook, uh, so with the yeah, RT Hirsebrook for the sense spectral sequence, those generators are trying to give you the sort of the, the, the Galois cohomology of the absolute Galois group of this ring spectrum. I mean, in, in, in the, uh, so, so in the case of the number field, I mean, the, 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 the zero first and second Galois cohomology of the number field with FT coefficients and the various twists are, are added together to give the cohomology of, uh, well, well, to give the, the additive basis of the zip for the K theory. So, so if one could make slightly more uh, precise calculations of not, not just that, this, uh, that these homotopy groups are finite, but if you could actually sort of identify what they are, that should give some kind of indication of what, uh, what the absolute Galois cohomology uh, of, of these ring spectra should be, if there is such a thing. I mean, I mean they're not fields, so it's not exactly Galois cohomology. There's all sorts of issues about uh, the difference between Galois and et al. cohomology. But, um, but, but I think that, that might be... Um, 
I mean, the, in the example for PP1, we at least see some kind of uh, duality. You have Tate Plateau duality in the, in the uh, Tau and Galois cohomology for the number field. And then for the K theory of topological K theory, we see a sort of a cohomological dimension three Tate duality where the cup product with the perfect pairing lands in third cohomology rather than second cohomology. So it's sort of tempting to think that there, there should be for, for the K theory, for BPN, there should be some kind of uh, Tate duality landing in N plus second cohomology. Um, so, so I mean, I think you might be getting close to to seeing what that kind of whether that kind of duality can happen, and 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 even perhaps even say something about what those sort of motivic or Galois cohomological groups ought to be, um, because the these um, I mean, so, so there is a spectral sequence here between the say motivic cohomology and the K theory which you're computing. But usually for large primes, uh, the, that spectral sequence will collapse. They're, they're probably, it's probably possible to show that at least for large primes, that spectral sequence should collapse so that so you should be able to make some counts. Um, Thanks. That. Yeah, that's, that would be, that sounds super interesting. And uh, I would love to see, uh, yeah, I would love to think about that um, sort of numerology of this sort of Galois cohomology uh, matching up. I wonder, I mean, it, maybe this is just me free associating and uh, conflating two things, but you know, like any FP spectrum has a sort of like Tate duality and it's LNF uh, lo localization or Anderson duality or whatever. Um, I mean, is that supposed to be related to the duality that you're that you were talking about, or or is that just me free associating? I mean, it matches for for, K, for topological K theory. Um, maybe. Well, per, well, then that's a conjecture, right? I mean, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Very cool. Yeah, yeah I, um, I gave some details on these computations in as it's in section five of, of, of the talk I gave in two thousand and fourteen. Perfect. I'll uh, have to look at that again. And uh, I, I know that uh, one thing that was yeah it was hard to so if you run through the argument that we give and a, so with the spectral sequences if you know if you know what type of smith tota complex exists, so like how many powers you have to take, then that does at least give you, all of these statements were about isomorphisms in large degrees. Um, and, and if you knew what types of smith tota, what types of VN self maps existed and you traced through the argument that we didn't make super effective, but you just did it, um, then it would at least give you a bound on that. And in particular, if you know that VN exists, and I think this gives an alternative uh, way to compute what sort of the actual answer is, um, like you were saying. But yeah, I don't know. Can I ask a question that's maybe for John? <laughs> so I, I think there's a paper of you in Engelwald or something where you compute like the THH of KO with F2 coefficients or something. Um, does it fall out of that, whether or not the Siegel conjecture is true for the THH of KO tensored with one of these finite complexes? Uh, I would have to think about that. I don't know offhand. I mean, the, um... I guess uh, the, the, yeah, it's part of his master's thesis, some of this computation. Then of course there was a later paper together with Mike Hill and Tyler Lawson where they make a better computation with more fun. Um, but um, but I, I don't think we thought about, I don't think we, yeah, we didn't, uh, I don't think we got around to actually trying to decide whether the seal conjecture holds for TJ to KO at, Two or three, no. Um, but I have the feeling, yeah. Um, as far as I can remember right now, anyway. No. Okay, uh, let's let's thank Dylan again. <laughs> <laughs>